surprised at how many people have and we started doing your collection I think about two years two or three years ago are you surprised at how popular you are and how much how often I, I, you have I'm, to sign I'm for us I, I'm shocked but you me, know me too coach you, I, I'm you not know, kidding you know who's more shocked my wife she said you you keep going up there and sign that stuff she said they throw it away or what they did because I I I look on myself not as a celebrity I am a simple individual that just had certain beliefs and certain values, and, and I've been blessed. You know, I was in the lower half of my high school class, and I was a great athlete, and I speak with a lisp, and I'm sort of funny looking, and uh, have a physique. It appears like I've been afflicted with very, very scurvy all my life. I just <laughs> try to go along and do the right thing and do the best I can and let people know I care about them. We were talking a, a few uh, months ago, and, and you had mentioned, you know, you have very few regrets, if any, but you have one. Yes. Um, one one regret I, I really have, <clears throat> and I was talking to the NASCAR drivers the other day uh, in a little pep talk for ESPN. Uh, there was a uh, Gordon Air, uh, Kyle Busch, and uh, Tony Stewart, and I said the one thing you know there they are they're very successful they're on top. And the thing I regret the most, we went to Notre Dame, took program on the bottom, we took it to the very top. And for nine straight years, we went to a January 1 bowl, the sugar, the cotton, the orange, or the fiesta. Nobody's done it before, nobody's done it since. And we got on top, you get on top, and you're successful, and you say, you know, this is pretty good. Let's not jeopardize it. Let's not take any risks. Let's not try to grow. Let's just protect where we are. And it's the dumbest thing in the world, because there's a rule of life that said you're either growing or you're dying. The tree's either going or it's dying, so is a person, so is a business. And doesn't have a thing to do with age. There are no age restrictions on dreams. But there's everything to do. Am I trying to get somewhere? Am I trying to improve? Or am I just going along and maintain it? And when I left Notre Dame, I never thought I'd coach again. I mean, where you go from Notre Dame, according to my mother, go directly to heaven, you sit by the Pope. You, you don't coach him. But once I got out, I found out I wasn't tired of coaching. I was tired of maintaining. When you try to maintain, you never have a new idea. You never have reason to celebrate. You never have reason to get excited. And so that's the one thing I say to all successful people. Always try to get better. Did you feel like the, uh, going to the Jets situation? Because it's very, I mean, the Jets, Jets, Jets. Everyone's talking about the Jets. New stadium, new ownership. You know, Woody Johnson, Rex Ryan. How hard is it to win there? How was your experience when you were with the Jets? I mean, tell, take me back to that experience. <clears throat> well, the year was 1975, and we had had four great years at NC State. And I was a very young coach, very happy, had a good team coming back. And Al Ward and the New York Jets decided I should be the head coach. Uh, and when they offered me the job, I turned it down. And Al Ward, a wonderful person, said to me, come to New York and tell Mr. Hess yourself you don't want a coach. So I went up there to say no. And I met with Mr. Phil Islin and Leon Hess and Al Ward in New York, some French restaurant. And I called my wife, she said, you did what? I said, I'm the head coach of the Jets. She said, you went up there to turn it down. I said, well, you know, if we don't like it, we can always go back to intercollegiate athletics. So I came up here without a vision, without a plan, uh, just let's go see what it's like. And I could not have worked for a finer individual in this world than Leon Hess and Phil Wilson. I mean, beautiful people. Give everything you needed. But every time something went wrong, I'd say, I didn't think this would work out. I didn't think this is what I want to do. And it bothers me to this day that I walked away after one year, signed a five-year contract, left after one year because of a lack of commitment. And a couple weeks ago, I went to Birmingham, Alabama to do a roast for a fundraiser for Joe Namath. Richard Todd was there and Joe Namath. And we, we, we talked about the New York Jets and experienced it. I, I feel bad that I let those people down. But as young, as immature, didn't understand what professional football is all about, I don't think you should ever hire somebody to coach in professional football unless they had been an assistant on that level also. Because the whole schedule is different, the mentality is different, the way you do things, the practice schedule. I'm used to having 100 people at practice, all of a sudden you got 50 and 20 of them are in the training room. How do you get better, et cetera? 
And uh, I, I feel bad that I was unfair to the New York Jets, and there's nothing I can do to change it. Do I regret it? Yes, absolutely. Not going there, but just the fact that I didn't fulfill the commitment that they gave me. A couple of quick questions. Who is your favorite coach right now? And we've seen, by the way, uh, many coaches try the, the professional route, not succeed, so you won't be the, the last or the first, but who's your favorite coach? Give me a couple of your favorite coaches right now that you love, that are outstanding, that work their programs the way you work them. Oh, well, my son Skip, who's doing very well. He did a great job at East Carolina, he's down in South Florida. But I, I think you have to look at Nick Saban. I think Nick Saban, just his mentality, his work ethic. Urban Meyer coached for me at uh, Notre Dame, outstanding coach. I think what Bobby Stoops has done at Oklahoma, and this might be one of his better teeth. But I love Joe Paterno. I love Bobby Bowden. I, I thought the, those two guys were, you know, we grew up together, so to speak. And, you know, there was a time where you went to a coaches convention, all the head coaches would get together in somebody's suite. And, and I'd be a young coach. I remember Bear Bryant once saying, not to me, but to the group, don't worry about making friends. Don't worry about making enemies. Worry about winning. He said, if you win, your enemies can't hurt you. If you lose, your friends can't save you. Now today, with the multi-million dollar salaries and everything, everybody feels that everybody else is an enemy and et cetera. It's about one up and shit. And you lose what this sport's all about. Football's such a great sport because it's like life. You, you get knocked down, you got to get up, you got to subjugate your welfare for the welfare of the team. Yeah? I just get excited when I talk about it, but I don't like some of the directions that's happening today. What's left? I mean, uh, for you, the, you know, what's, what, what's some things you're looking forward to? Uh, you know, when, when they put you in the Hall of Fame and they build a statue to you at the University of Notre Dame, but I, maybe they need a place for the pigeons, I, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think it's uh, doing whatever I can to make this a better country for the people in the future. You know, I, there isn't anything else I want to accomplish in athletics, and I'm not trying to get an Emmy or anything else in TV, but just... Can, can I make a difference in people's lives? And I, I think this is a key question everybody has to ask themselves. If I didn't show up, who would miss me and why? If you didn't go home, would your family miss you? If you didn't go to work, would your company miss you? If your company went out of business, they may miss you. And, and where I really got that thought uh, was from a very good friend here in, in New York that owns all the sporting goods companies. You know who I'm talking Which about. Which model? Mitch Modell, you hit it, one of the great people. He told me that many years ago, and I've used it in speeches because it's so true. Let's make sure that we're making a difference in people's lives. And at my age, as I say, that, that's all you can try to do. Make maybe, sure. I may be reading you a little, I think I'm reading you right, but you seem very content and happy with your place. I, I think it. Uh, seem to be in good spirit. I think happiness is being content with what you have. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've, I've got great family. I've got a great wife, great children, you know, and just well, I'm going to try to make a difference in, in this country. And uh, what holds the country together are our core values. And what are our core values anymore? I don't know. It used to be honesty. used to be hard work. used to be obligation to your fellow human being. Um, one last thing. Your championship team. What separated that team? What was the difference there? Why, why that team? What was so special about that team? Well, to win a national championship, you got to be lucky, number one. And I don't care which team you're on. There's going to be a play or two with going to change your season. That year, Miami went for two and didn't make it. We win 31-30. The year next was a better football team. We went 12-0, beat seven conference champions. And uh, we lose to Miami when they complete a third and 42 pass from their nine-yard line. Uh, but, uh, or, or maybe in 93, we end up losing it because we drop an interception with 20 seconds to go and they kick a field goal, which was our only blemish. But what is it? You, you, there's three things. You try to get players you can trust. Get players who are totally committed to excellence. You get players that care about each other. And if you have somebody you can trust or committed to care, you put your arm around them, hug them, and never let them go. But I also think that the great champions are the ones that love what they're doing. 
They loved the game of football. You didn't have to give them a pep talk to come out to practice. They wanted to come to practice. They had fun. They liked football. There are too many people who play football today because somebody said you should or they think they can make a lot of money, et cetera, or because it's an individual sport. Play the game because you really, truly love it. And when you get people who love the game, man, they come to practice. They're going to get better. You laugh. You joke. You get on them. It's like Marcus Thorne. Marcus Thorne's now a doctor. Great guy. But he was a fullback. He always went the wrong way. I said, Marcus Thorne, someday I'm